Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and start. We've got some people I know still going through the food line. Um, but we have a bunch of people streaming, so I don't want to leave them hanging out there all day. Um, so welcome. We're here to talk about the new CIFRA regulations, uh, CIFRA, CFRA, whatever you want to call it. Um, we used to come up with really catchy titles for the Lunch and Learn, and now I'm just, okay, it's called the new regulations, yeah, whatever. Um, some real quick housekeeping before I start, though. There's restrooms through here for anybody who's not familiar with this room, so feel free to get up if you need to. There's plenty of food in the back, so definitely help yourselves um, because I tend to eat the leftovers, so we don't want that. Um, the reason we're here today, you know, this is typical California, where as soon as you figure out how to navigate something, they change all the rules on you, okay? So we've got to stay up to date on this kind of stuff. It's a great reminder. Um, just to make sure you know that when we talk about handbooks and these kinds of policies, whether it's leave of absence, wage and hour, this stuff is constantly evolving. It's constantly changing, whether through new regulations like we have in this case or through court decisions, um, whether they're federal decisions or state decisions. Uh, and then, of course, we have our new statutes that come out each year. So this is not something we get to just check off of our to-do list and say, now we know how to do leave of absence and we're all done. Of course, this stuff will change. Um, and when I come back in a couple months and do the legal update, I'll give you all the new information about how this stuff has changed from today to then, okay? So this stuff is constantly evolving. Um, a little bit of background on why we have these new regulations. You know, we have the, the CFRA, that's our big state law where we get our big leave of absence rights in California. The companion law to that is called the FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act. That's the big federal law. And what happened was in 2009, we had brand new regulations for the FMLA. And those came about because we had some expansions in the types of leave you could take. They added in the service member leave and qualifying exigency and some new types of leave. And so when they added those, they decided, hey, we better go back and change the regulations because you know, nobody knows what an exigency is, all right? Uh, I still don't know what an exigency is, and I read the 800 pages of regulations. Um, at any rate, we, we had new regulations that came about in 2009. And what happened was a lot of the terms in those FMLA regulations got tweaked just a little, just a word here or there. But any of you who have come to my legal updates know, you know, a single word is certainly something that we can have a giant lawsuit about. And I, I do have a theory that we're going to litigate every single word in the labor code at some point. Um, at any rate, we had this disconnect because the CFRA regulation said, hey, we're going to follow the FMLA, and we're going to follow the 1993 regulations. Didn't say anything about those new regulations. So there was a, a real quandary for employers, because do I look to the FMLA regulations like the CIFRA regulations say? Do I look to the old regulations or the new regulations? And what do we do when there's a conflict? Okay, and generally, we're going to follow the rule most favorable to the employee. Okay, and that sounds fine and good, but when you have things like just little words, um, at least as much as, or more than. How do those things really apply? And so it was creating a big um, sort of area of inconsistency. And in order to kind of streamline that process, California said, okay, you've redone your regulations, we're gonna redo ours, and we're gonna try and make them as consistent as possible. And that was the goal starting out, okay? Um, a good goal, I think it's gonna be helpful for employers in the long run, and as we parse through this, you're gonna see that there are a lot of areas where they have made the regulations pretty consistent, or at least streamlined them and addressed issues where there's an inconsistency. So you have a little more guidance um, from that point. There are definitely still areas where there's a big difference, though, okay? And so the key is to be aware of where those differences exist, so you don't happen to fall into a, you know, mine hole somewhere, okay, that you didn't even know was there, um, and so that we can be aware of this kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance because this stuff is totally boring. I mean, this is really, there's nothing worse than reading pages and pages of regulations, okay? You'll start to wish you were illiterate, and I'm not joking. Um, I try to make this stuff usually kind of entertaining or fun, but there's just really not a lot of material here. So we'll march through it as best we can. Um, one last thing, I had talked to a handful of you about the new forms that you need, and I'm about 95% of the way done. I'm done with the, in, the individual serious health condition form, um, but I still need to update the family member's uh, certification form. So um, that's something that we'll talk about in here that you need to start using as of July 1. I expect, this week is really pretty booked up, but I expect by next week I'll have both of those forms available. And, and again, for legal solutions clients, 
you're able to access those forms through your account. If you have any questions about that, you can see Kelsey, uh, or you can certainly email me, and I can forward those forms along to you as well. All right, so we're going to dive right in to our new CIFRA regulations. Okay, so they go into effect July 1. They were approved uh, middle of March, I think. Um, this is, you know, a pretty comprehensive overhaul. And so because it's a pretty comprehensive overhaul, we have all sorts of different areas that, were, that received little tweaks and changes, whether it's definitions or reinstatement or intermittent leave, all sorts of different areas of the regulations that, that got, were changed. Okay, and we're going to march through every single one of them, so just bear with me. Um, we now have incorporated the new FMLA regulations that happened in 2009. Okay, and then the, there were a couple other changes in, in 2013. And so we picked up all of those. That's all fine and good. If tomorrow the FMLA regulations get changed, okay, which could happen, all right, those new regulations would not be part of the CFRA. So we may down the road end up in the same spot we were in before these regulations uh, were enacted. But for now, we're relatively consistent. Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, the first thing is defined terms. And these are the definitions. As in, the, in the beginning of the statute, they list all these definitions. When we talk about an employer, this is what we mean. When we talk about an employee, this is what we mean. And so some of the tweaks to that, specifically for covered employers, they added in successors in interest. Okay, So now a successor in interest needs to provide CFRA coverage All right, if the, if the initial employer was uh, covered by the CFRA. The other thing, though, is uh, a joint employment status. And they basically said for F or CFRA purposes, in order to decide if this employer is actually an employer that the law applies to, okay, um, we're going to look at, um, in the case of a, like, this would be like a temp employee, okay? They, are, they get their paycheck from the temp service, but they actually work over here. So who's the employer, all right? And they decided we're going to look at a totality of the circumstances test. That's what they use. We look at the economic reality of the situation, all right, and that's all they said. They didn't give us any criteria. You don't look at who cuts the paycheck. You don't look at how many hours they're at one place. You don't look at who's controlling the employee. Okay, they didn't give us really any guidance. From, you know, here's a little secret. When the, when the answer is, uh, I don't know, or who knows, okay, the legislature will insert, let's use a totality of the circumstances test, okay. What this means for all of you is that if you've got an employee who might be in a joint employment situation where it might be you employing them but it might be another company, you're going to want to look at that carefully. Each one of those situations will be different. This comes up for PEO clients, comes up for people who use temp employees. It's always safer to presume that, they're going to, that you're covered, presume that you need to provide um, the CFRA coverage. All right. Um, okay, so that's our covered employer change. Um, changes to uh, the eligible employee. Um, okay, they need to be employed for at least 12 months. Okay, previously it was more than 12 months. Now it's consistent with the FMLA regs, and we say at least 12 months. Okay, you think that doesn't make a big difference, but I guarantee you, in California, we would have had a lawsuit because it would have been one minute past that day. You know, and somebody would have <coughs> been tried to be denied their leave. Um, the 12 months must be any time prior to the commencement of the CFRA leave. Okay, we don't have these restrictions where it goes back more than seven years. An employee can become eligible while they're out on leave. Okay, so if I've only worked there for, not, for say, 11 months, now I go out on leave, and while I'm out on leave, I've now been an employee, you know, after the end of that 12th month and one day, Hey, now I've been an employee for 12 months. But one month of that was while I was actually on leave. Okay, that doesn't matter. You can now become eligible, and starting on the day after the end of the 12th month, okay, that time can be designated as CFRA. All right. Clarifies that an employee must work at a site where there are at least 50 employees within 75 miles. And they gave a really interesting example. Okay, and they, they used the example of a person who's a salesperson in California. But they work for a company that's based in New York. Okay? They get their sales leads from New York. Their paycheck comes from New York. They report to New York. Hey, okay, the company is based in New York, and I work out of my home, and it's just me. Now, when I want to take CFRA leave, the company says, oh, we've only got one employee you know, in your 75-mile radius, so you're not entitled to CFRA. And they said, no, that's not the case. If you've got an employee who's reporting, being paid, getting assignments from another location, we look at that location as the work site. Okay, so we're going to pick up probably a lot of other people 
that um, we maybe could have excluded before. All right, are there questions? If there are questions about this stuff, I, am, I tend to go through this stuff really quickly because I hate going through defined terms. <laughs> but um, if there are questions, you know, don't be shy. We've got a, this is a lot of detailed stuff. Okay, serious health condition. So they made some changes in terms of what qualifies as a serious health condition. Okay, when we talk about continuing treatment, there remains a difference between what the FMLA says and what the CFRA says. Okay, they recognize the difference and they decided not to go with the, with the FMLA. One other point I'll make, the way that the materials are, are broken out, I'm going through each section and, and talking about the changes within, but at the very end I have a sort of breakdown of FMLA versus CFRA. So don't worry about it if you see these things like, oh wait, this is different, this is different. I, I've condensed that all into one place for you so that you'll have that at the end. Um, at any rate, under the FMLA, when we talk about continuing um, treatment, it needs to be three full days, okay? We don't have that full requirement in California, all right? It just needs to be three days. There also is no requirement in California that treatments be within 30 days of the first day of incapacity or within the first seven days following the first day of incapacity. All of those, you know, extra requirements are not in the CFRA. You need any two treatments. Okay, and that counts as continuing treatment. The other change that, um, that we have is for inpatient care. Okay, and this is one of the changes that's actually reflected in this new certification form. Um, and the idea is, you know, if you have somebody who says, hey, I, you know, was, went in for inpatient care, but they released me at 11.59 p.m., you know, I didn't actually stay overnight, does that count? Is that still inpatient care? I thought I was gonna stay the night, but you know, the hospital filled up or something. The doctor told me I could go home. Um, what do we do? And, and under the CFRA, that will count as inpatient care. If you're admitted with the expectation that you're gonna stay overnight, okay, that's enough. <coughs> under the FMLA, you have to have an actual overnight stay. Okay, so if you're released at 11.59, that does not qualify under the FMLA, but it does under the CFRA. Okay. Um, Okay, other defined terms. We now have the key employee exception under the CFRA. That's consistent with what we have in the FMLA. There is a series of requirements. Typically, you know, this is, your, this is the top of the pile, okay? We don't get to say, you know, Joey's the key employee because everyone goes to Joey all the time, okay? It's gotta be somebody who's earning a lot, who's really integral to the, the business and so forth, all right? Your top 10% of your wage earners and all that kind of stuff. Um, but th those are consistent with what we have under FMLA. Um, they expanded birth of a child to include baby bonding. And then we picked up some, some changes with respect to spouses, okay? And that's because we have the, the registered domestic partners and uh, same-sex marriage. And that stuff is still really in flux. Under the FMLA, we had a rule that basically said, look, we're gonna look at the place of celebration not the place where the person works. And that comes up because I've got a lot of clients who have multi-state operations. So what do you do if somebody gets married in California and their same-sex marriage is valid here, we move them to Texas, to our other office. Okay, they're working in Texas and they wanna take, uh, you know, FMLA or, C or well, FMLA over there um, for their spouse, but Texas doesn't recognize same-sex marriages. Okay, under the FMLA, they say, we're gonna look at the place of celebration. So typically that person would have been entitled to it. Okay, that all sounds fine and, fine and good, but we had a case about you know, three months ago that said, nope, that's unconstitutional. You can't tell the states what to do. And so it's all up in flux. The US Supreme Court is going to rule on this issue. So we should have an answer uh, fairly soon in terms of what do we look at? Do we look at where they work or do we look at where they actually were married? Okay. All right. Um, Limitations on uh, CFRA rights. Okay, so when we've got, under CFRA, if you have two parents that both work for the same employer, okay, and they wanna take time off for baby bonding, we can limit that to 12 weeks between the two parents. So, you know, the mom gets six weeks, the dad gets six weeks, or whatever. I mean, you don't get to, you don't get to dictate. Or every mom would be like, ooh, the dad gets 11 weeks. <laughs> and, you know, he can stay up and nurse the baby all night. Um, so we don't, the employer doesn't get to decide, but you can limit the maximum number of, amount of time to 12 weeks, okay? That's only for baby bonding though, okay? It's, if they've got two spouses that work together and 
they both want to take off for a serious health condition or one wants to take off for his own serious health condition and the spouse wants to take off to care for a family member with a serious health condition, that's fine, okay? They both get a full 12 weeks. They only get 12 weeks, though, total for the year for any one of those qualifying reasons, okay? So I don't get to take six weeks of baby bonding and then I take 12 weeks to care for my spouse and then I take 12 weeks for my own uh, medical condition. I get 12 weeks total, okay? Uh, but we only get to do that carve up when you have two spouses working for baby bonding. All right. Okay, reinstatement. Um, so at the time when you grant them their leave, okay, you need to inform the employee that they are entitled to reinstatement back to the similar or comparable position, okay? Which the way similar and comparable position are defined is basically the identical exact same position. I mean, they can really argue almost anything. You know, it, it's slightly cooler in this section of the office, so therefore it's not the same position, all right? Um, and really they, they have, nitpicked about the most crazy things. Um, so basically, you're going to put this person back to the identical position, and you need to tell them that you're going to do that when they go out on leave. Okay. Um, if they're no longer qualified at the time of reinstatement, all right, we have to give them an opportunity to become qualified. And what I mean by that is if you have someone who has some, like a specialized license or certification, and they go out on leave, and oh shucks, now their license has lapsed or they're, they're not certified anymore to do the forklift. Okay, I need to allow them enough time to become recertified. I don't just get to say, oh well, sorry, you're not qualified to run our forklift anymore, so we're gonna go with the temp who we hired while you were gone and he's really great. You know, that's the question I get all the time because what will happen is somebody goes out on leave, okay, and we bring somebody new in to fill that spot during that gap, you know, and guess what? The temp is way better, you know, or you discover the person actually didn't do anything and you don't even need a temp to fill that position, okay? We don't get to consider that stuff. We still need to bring them back. And we don't get, there, there's no defense of the temp is better, okay? Um, I wish there was. Um, okay, they added a rights upon return section that defines what a comparable position is, okay? And that's basically where we get this definition of it's exactly the same position. Yeah, is there a question? I'm hearing things, okay. Um, and the employer can accommodate an employee's request to be restored to a different position, okay? So if the employee comes to you and says, hey, I know I was out and I used to run the forklift, but I'd really rather work in the shop, okay? That's fine, you can accommodate that if you want. My little caveat for you is get it in writing. I want a note from that employee that says, I voluntarily elected to move to this. I was not coerced, intimidated, instructed, blah, 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 anything by my employer to do so. This is my own voluntary choice, okay? Because what can happen is down the road, of course, when you lay them off or fire them or whatever, or they get really mad at you, they'll come back and say, gee, I went out on leave, and then they moved me to the shop. And they tend to sometimes remember things a little differently than the employer does. Um, so just make sure you get that in writing if, if that happens. Okay, defenses to reinstatement. And what I mean by this are, these are reasons or times when you would not have to restore that employee to that same position, okay? And so when does the employer have the option of saying, oh, shucks, by the way, you don't get to come back, okay? And the big one is this, if they would have been not employed otherwise. Okay, what we mean by that is there's a layoff. So I go out on leave. While I'm out on leave, the company gets totally restructured and they do away with the sales department entirely. Now I come back and I'm the you know, top sales girl, okay? And they say, shucks, we have no sales department anymore. You would have been laid off with everybody else. You're not protected just because you were out on a leave, okay? What I see all the time though is the layoff of one, okay? And that's not gonna work because you don't get to say, well, we restructured the sales force so that you're not part of it, okay? If you're gonna lay everybody off, I want you to lay everybody off. And here's another one that I had a client try not too long ago. They said, well, we're laying off the entire department, okay? Oh, great, okay, well, then we don't have to worry about this girl who's out on leave. Okay, we're gonna rehire everybody else uh, back from that department. We don't get to do that either, okay? And we're gonna rename the department, you know, much better department now that, you know, Jill's not here, whatever. No, we don't get to do that. So if it truly is a layoff, that's fine. If it's a restructure, I like to have that link to some sort of business reason. There's a, you know, something that we can tie that to. And of course, the more employees that are being laid off, um, the better from the employer's vantage in terms of that it looks like this is really legitimate. 
You know, if you're only laying two people off, I don't know. That, that starts to, you start to get into that gray area where it looks like you're trying to come up with some fabricated reason to lay this person off. Okay, so, but if it's, it's a true restructure and layoff, then that's fine. Um, the employer has the burden to show that the employee would not have been employed on the requested reinstatement date. Okay, this gets into a really sort of picky question because under the FMLA it, and previously under the CFRA, it was you look at it at the time that reinstatement is requested. Okay, so do we look at is there a position available when the employee asks to be reinstated or at the date that they're actually going to come back? Okay, under the CFRA, we look at the date when they're actually going to come back, not the date when they say, hey, I'm going to be coming back. Okay, and so we'll see how that plays out because, you know, if you're trying to make a decision in how you're going to restructure your business and the employee asks on this date but you make a different decision and on this date when they come back, there's no position for them, that's where that discrepancy would come up. Okay, so it's just something to be mindful of. Um, of course, the defense does not apply if the position was, if the person was just replaced. You know, that's, the temp is better, okay? We don't get to say, oh, shucks, there's no position for you here because, you know, Susie Temp is doing it and she's great. All right, that, we don't get to use that defense then. Um, and then they added a provision that if somebody uses fraud to obtain the CFRA leave, you know, they make something up, their brother's a doctor, he fills out the certification and they go on vacation, okay, we, the, we can deny that, all right? It is the employer's burden, however, to show that that's not, that it was fraudulent, okay, that it's not legit, all right? Under the FMLA, you can, you know, you can not give somebody FMLA if you can show that it's fraud, but you don't have the burden necessarily to prove that, okay? So that's a, that's a change. All right, computation of the leave period, and that, what I mean by that is when we say you get 12 months, how do we decide what 12 months is? You know, is it January to December? Is it a rolling period that starts the day they ask? Do we look backwards? Do we look forward? Okay, and they basically said, look, you can calculate that 12-month period however it works for your business. Okay, this is all consistent with the FMLA. From my vantage and in counseling employers, I think it's always better to use a rolling calendar. All right, you're gonna have a different 12-month measuring period for each employee. That's the downside to that, so it creates a little more paperwork um, on the administration side, but I think it's a lot cleaner and a lot easier. So when I come in and ask for FMLA and it's May 21st, they're gonna look backwards from this May 21st back through last May 22nd or whatever of the past year. Did I take any FMLA? Did I take any CFRA? And if so, how much do I still have available? Okay, I think that's a, a better way to, to run that. The problem with using the calendar year is that they can take the first 12 weeks of January Okay, or the last 12 weeks in, you know, ending in December 31st, and then we start a brand new year, then they can take another 12 weeks beginning January 1. So you can end up with a situation where someone's out for 26 weeks in a row, okay, which can be pretty difficult to, to handle from the employer's standpoint. Um, okay, that's a provision about the treatment of holidays. All right, so um, if you've got somebody who's out on CFRA and it's July 4th, okay, and the office is closed, and that's our policy, and we typically give everybody that holiday off, or maybe we pay them while they're off. You know, you don't have to give paid holidays, but if you choose to, do I count that day as a day against their CFRA? And they say no. You do not get to count those holidays. If it's a day that they normally would have been scheduled, hey, we have a policy that we let everybody get paid time and a half on holidays or something like that, and they would have typically been there, then that day would count against their CFRA um, allotment. Um, as a provision speci specifying that overtime, um, when somebody goes out on reduced schedule or intermittent leave, okay, what do we do if they normally would have worked, say, a 10-hour day? Okay, now they're going to go down to a reduced schedule. They can only work five hours a day. When I deduct for their CFRA, do I deduct five hours or do I deduct only three hours? Because, you know, typically a work day is eight hours. Okay, and you can use overtime that they would have normally been scheduled and that they typically work. So I can deduct five hours for that employee. Okay, even though they're working five hours, I can take that additional five. That's only if that's something that they regularly typically work. Okay, so I don't, you know, if they say, hey, I need to go out on Friday for, you know, I'm on, my reduced schedule starts on Friday and it's Wednesday. Okay, I don't get to schedule them for 10 hours Wednesday and Thursday and now, oh, well, see, shucks, you're gonna, 
you know, we're going to deduct 10 hours every day. Okay, well, that's not going to work. I want to show a pattern and a practice that they historically have worked these additional hours and that it would have been expected. Um, okay. Intermittent leave. If they take intermittent or reduced schedule leave, you have to make a reason, they have to make a reasonable effort not to interrupt business operations. Okay, if I can only work, you know, three hours a day, I don't get to carve out the three busiest hours of the workday and then come in only on the slow time. All right, it <coughs> has to be something that they have to work with you so that they can, you know, decrease as much of the burden that the employer is going to bear as possible. Um, you limit leave increments to the shortest period of time that's measured by payroll. This is sort of a really strange provision, and I'm surprised that nobody has figured out that this is really not what anyone is doing. Because undoubtedly, your payroll system is calculating down probably to the minute. Okay, you might have a rounding practice that allows you to round, you know, five, ten minutes um, on either way. But when you do someone's paycheck, I'm presuming most of you, and if you aren't, don't tell me <laughs> or, or you know, call a lawyer immediately. Um, but I'm presuming your payroll is tracking down to the minute. And they basically say you need to measure leave the same, in the smallest increment that your payroll will capture it. Okay? Nobody is measuring CFRA time in terms of minutes. Okay? They say the largest number you can use is an hour. And I typically, most of my clients will measure in terms of hours. So a person is out X number of hours a day, that's going to count against their, their leave allotment. Okay? Um, but it's a little bit of a strange um, provision because it doesn't really work. Um, for baby bonding, under CFRA, we had this sort of weird provision that when somebody requests baby bonding leave on no less than two occasions, you have to allow leave of less than two weeks. Okay, but anything beyond that, you can require that it's taken in two week increments. All right, they now have put in a provision that the employer has the option of allowing smaller. Um, leave breaks for baby bonding. Okay, so you still have to do it at least two times. If you want to do it, you could do it, you know, ten more times if they want to take off an hour every other day or something like that. Um, and that was really to help employees. A lot of employees wanted to take a reduced schedule to, you know, pick up kids, daycare, and shuttle people around. And the employer is saying, sorry, you have to take it off in a two-week chunk, you know, which wasn't that helpful to the employees. So now the employer has the option. Okay, you only have to do it twice, but you can do it more frequently if you want. Um, okay. Employer can require temporary transfer if intermittent leave is granted for baby bonding. All right, we can, we can say, okay, you're going to go to this position instead because you're only going to work until noon every day or whatever the case may be. Um, they clarify how intermittent leave should be used when you've got somebody who uh, is leaving midway during a shift or in cases where they can't leave midway during a shift. And, and what I mean by that, you know, if you've got a flight attendant, okay, I, I can't jump off the plane at the fifth hour when I'm supposed to stop working, okay? And how do we handle intermittent leave requests when we've got a situation like that? So the regulations sort of walk you through that kind of stuff. I didn't put it all in here because those are really pretty specific examples. You know, it's like train engineers and flight attendants, which don't tend to come to my lunch and learns, so I glossed over some of that. Um, how can you reduce an exempt employee's pay, okay, when they go out on um, intermittent or reduced schedule leave? And I get this a lot. I've got a guy who's, you know, on a salary. He's making $80,000 a year, but now he's going to stop every day at 2 o'clock. Do I still have to pay him that $80,000? Okay. And the answer is no, but you want to be careful how you attack this because if you reduce their salary based on the hours that they go out, you may have them fall below the requirements that you need for whatever exemption they're qualifying for. Okay, so there's two times the minimum wage in order to be exempt typically, unless it's a inside sales, it's one and a half times minimum wage. But you want to be careful you don't decrease their salary so much that they lose their exempt status. Because then all of a sudden they're entitled to overtime and meal and rest periods, all that other stuff. That becomes a big pain in the neck. Okay, so that's something to really watch for. The quick solution, if you've got somebody like that, Switch them to an hourly employee, okay? We're going to pay you by the hour. You can convert their salary that they're making now into an hourly rate. We're going to pay you that same rate, so they're not seeing any reduction in their actual wage rate, and we're just going to pay you hourly while you're on leave, okay? That's, that's the quick answer to that one. Yeah?
Mm-hmm. And I know this comes up a lot when it comes to like the baby bonding. Is there any change with uh, the requirements of notifying the employer? Well, there there are some changes in terms of the the notice that the employee has to give, but they're pretty much in favor of the employee. There wasn't anything that there weren't any new burdens that were put on the employee to you know, hey, I'm going to work with you. Other than I'm going to try and work, you know, I have to ease the burden as much as I can. I have to use reasonable efforts and good faith in terms of setting up that intermittent schedule. But there's nothing else. The, the new certification form has a whole section for, hey, if the employee needs intermittent leave, uh, medical provider, can you check yes? And oh, if they do, how often? How frequent? How long is each you know, leave going to last? Oh, are, are they asking for a reduced schedule? Is that necessary? Okay, please check yes, if so. And how, um, you know, how reduced does it need to be? How many days a week can they work? All that stuff is now going to be in the certification form. So you will have that when the employee comes back with their medical certification, and it's going to have been provided by the actual health care provider. Okay, so that should get, you know, and, and some of that was to address those concerns of the employers like, well, it says on here he needs a reduced schedule or intermittent leave, but it doesn't give us any other information. Okay, and of course in California, we don't get to call the health care provider and ask, uh, what, by the way, what does this mean? All right, so that was the problem they ran into, and that's why they really tried to clarify that. So you will have additional notice, but there's no real obligation from the employee to discuss anything about that schedule. Yeah, well, I have it for the, um, for the employee's own serious health condition. I can get you that today. But, um, yeah, the, um, and, the, and for the family member's serious health condition, I'll have it in a week. Um, but we don't have to start using that new form until July 1. So you still have a little window of time. Uh, probably a good idea just to start using it now, though, anyway, because the information that you're going to ha get from that new form is going to be helpful. Okay. Um... I'm not sure what page I'm on. Let me see. I'm on page four. Okay. Um, okay, so we talked about that. All right, employee notice. Um, employees must respond to questions designated to determine fee, designated to determine if leave is CFRA qualifying and failure to respond can result in a denial of CFRA protection. So if the employee comes to you and says, hey, I... Uh, you know, I want to bond with my baby, or I have this serious medical condition, or I need time off for cancer, or my husband, you know, had a stroke, okay, something along those lines. If they give you some sort of reason to suspect that this might be uh, CFRA qualifying, all right, then they have to provide a response, all right. You're allowed to say, okay, well, here's the notice, here's your eligibility notice, and here's the medical certification, and if they don't participate in that process or don't bring back the medical certification, then you can, down the road, say, I'm sorry, this was not a CFRA approved or protected leave. You didn't show up for work and, you know, you could terminate them if you wanted to, okay? If they come in, though, and say, hey, I just need some time off, and they don't say anything about, you know, a CFRA reason, you know, maybe you happen to be friends with a spouse and you know they want the time off because you've heard from some back channel that he had a stroke, okay, that isn't, we don't get to ask any further questions, okay, we don't get to inquire as to whether or not they might want to take any protected leave or anything like that, okay, so it's only when they ask for time off, whether it's vacation, PTO, sick time, whatever, they ask for time off and they give some indication that there is a CFRA qualifying reason, okay, that's when we can inquire further and if we do inquire further and they don't provide the paperwork, then they're out of luck, okay? When they ask for the leave and say, oh, shucks, my husband had a stroke and I want to take some vacation, okay, that's enough to put the employer on notice that, hey, we need to start the FMLA CFRA paperwork. They don't have to specifically say, I'd like to take my family and medical leave, I'd like to take my California Family Rights Act leave, okay? They don't have to ask for that. They could just ask for vacation. They don't have to ask for unpaid leave. Once they give you that reason, Okay, the flag needs to go up. You go ding, 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 ding. Okay, let me run to my bank of forms and get this form for you, and we're going to start filling it out. Okay. Um, all right. Employer response. You have five business days to respond to a request for leave. You used to have ten. Uh, this is now consistent with the FMLA, so hopefully everybody was already responding within five days. Um, 
And the employer response is now aligned with the requirement that we first give them a notice. This is the rights and eligibility notice. And basically that notice just says, look, these are the leave rights that are provided under the FMLA. These are the rights provided under the CFRA. You have to have worked this many hours. You have to be at a location with 50 employees within 75 miles. You have to have worked for 12 months. All that kind of qualifying stuff. All right. And we give that to them. We give them also a copy of the relevant medical certification, whether it's for their own serious health condition or for their family members. Okay. We give them a copy of the job description so that they can take that to the medical provider and the medical provider can look at it when they fill out whether or not they're able to do the job. Okay. And all that paperwork, we give them all that. At the same time, they take all of that back, bring the certification back to the employer. Okay. And then the employer is going to give them a designation notice. And that basically says, yep, You've worked the right number of hours. You hadn't taken any FMLA in the last 12 months. You have 12 weeks available. This is a qualifying reason. We'll see you on the 30th of June or whatever. Okay, so that's how that form process runs. And the CFRA and FMLA are now consistent in terms of how the process runs. They are not consistent in terms of the forms that you actually use, okay, which I'll get to. Basically, the initial rights notice is, is fine. But the medical certification forms, you need to use the California forms. Do not use the forms that are published by the Department of Labor that are for the FMLA. Those medical certification forms do not contain the language we have to have in California with respect to the genetic information protections, with respect to not disclosing underlying symptoms. There's a bunch of other little weird changes, of course, that we have to have in California because we're special and great. Um, so we've got our own form, okay? So do not use that form. Um, and again, that's the form that I can get you. I can get you the employee's own serious health condition today and the other one next week. Um, okay, so those are the forms we're going to give them when they come in and ask for leave. And then the actual medical certification itself. This is where we see probably the biggest discrepancy. I mean, aside from, you know, pregnancy and the military caregivers, this is where we see the biggest change between FMLA versus the CFRA is in this medical certification form. So if you get the certification form back, you know, and doctors scribble and have horrible handwriting and you can't read anything, okay, as a California employer, you can call that medical provider and say, did you actually fill out this form? Okay, and that's all you can say. You can't say, I can't read this because it's all written in like lines and scribbles. What does it mean? Uh, we don't get to ask any questions, okay? Under the FMLA, you can call to clarify, okay, what, what does this mean? You know, it looks like it's written in Greek. Um, but we don't get to do that under the CFRA. One of the things, and that's why it's really critical that you use a very good medical certification form, because instead of having spaces for the doctors to write words, okay, there's a box and they write a check, okay? So even if they can't check, you can see which box is, you know, it's like the hanging chads or whatever, trying to decipher that kind of stuff. Um, but if you use the form, the standard form, there's a box for them to check, and, and it's pretty easy and self-explanatory. Um, you can't ask for symptoms, diagnosis, okay? Hopefully no one is doing that. I don't want to know what's wrong with them. I, you know, it's not that I don't care about it or about them, but I just don't want to know any of that stuff. That can absolutely infect the entire process of leave management if you've got somebody and you happen to know that, oh, shucks, they've got this horrible condition that's going to flare up every six months, and now we don't want to bring them back. And, and when we don't bring them back because they would have been laid off, they're going to say, well, you knew that this was going to be ongoing. I was going to be on dialysis for forever, and my costs were going to go up. And so it can really infect that process. Okay? You don't want to know any of that kind of stuff. Um, failure to return medical certification can result in denial of CFRA leave. That's something that we need to tell them up front. Okay? If you don't, here's the rights and eligibility. Here's the medical certification form. If you don't bring this back, then you're not going to necessarily be entitled to reinstatement or to, pr to protected leave. Okay, we want to tell them that up front. And, and failure to tell them, you know, there's an argument that if you fail to tell them that, that, you know, them not bringing back a medical certification is not going to be enough to, you know, get rid of those protections they have. All right, there was a case in, uh, under the FMLA that said, look, the guy never returned the, the FMLA certification form. So we got to fire him. Okay, we don't have a similar case like that in California. Um, so I would advise you just to make sure. And that can be one of the hardest parts in terms of managing leave is to get the person to actually return the form. All right. Um, generally, they're supposed to return it. You know, I think in, under the FMLA, it's 10 days. And I think in uh, the CFRA, they have a reasonable amount of time. Um, I would err on the side of giving that employee more time. 
okay? Because it's very easy for them to come back and say, I couldn't get in to see my doctor until this date. It's, all, it's very impacted and so forth. Um, okay, so second opinions, okay? In California, we only get a second opinion if we have a good faith reason to dispute it and if the qualifying reason is the employee's own serious health condition. Okay, I don't get to get a second opinion when it's their spouse or their family member's serious health condition. Okay, there's no second opinion for baby bonding. I don't know how you get a second opinion on that, but anyway. Um, under the FMLA, there's a lot of other instances when you can get a, a second opinion. Okay, you need a good faith reason, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, if it's filled out by their sister, okay, and that's the doctor, you know, or it's in crayon, and you're like, really, this is not, a doctor did not fill this out. Okay, that's what I want, that kind of objective reason to doubt that certification. Under the CFRA, we can only ask for recertification at the expiration of that leave period. So if they were originally put out until May 20th, okay, on May 20th, I can ask for a new certification. I don't get to ask for it, you know, earlier than that. Under the FMLA, there's a series, you know, there's different times when you can ask for um, recertification, okay. Return to work release. Um, Employers are not entitled to a return to work for le release for intermittent leave. So this is somebody, you know, I'm going to go on reduced schedule, and so I'm going to, you know, leave every day at noon. Okay, well, I don't get to get a fitness for duty the next day when they show up at, you know, at 8. And then they've left at noon, they left early, okay, another fitness for duty. No, I get one fitness for duty when they come back on that release, on that reduced schedule. Okay. Um, Employers cannot require a fitness for duty re exam as a condition um, to return to work unless it's job cons or unless it's uh, job consistent or consistent with business necessity and job related. Okay, there was a, a big case that I talked about at the legal update. This was under the FMLA, and um, where they basically said, yeah, you can do a fitness for duty if if somebody's coming back and you have reason to suspect that or concerns about their performance. It was a very sort of specific case, though. She was a um, I, I think a detective or some, or an investigator for the DA's office. So she was carrying a gun and she went out for mental issues and she was unstable and crazy and whatever. So then she says, oh, I'm better now. Okay, I want to come back to work. And the employer is thinking, I don't, want, I don't know if I want to give her a gun. You know, she was crazy yesterday and today she's fine. And so there were some real concerns. Okay, I think that was a very specific type of case. All right, I don't know that I would rely on that even though that's a protection we have in the FMLA, and the CFRA is now consistent with the FMLA. I would be very, very careful about asking for that kind of fitness for duty. You really want to make sure you align that with the job, okay? I mean, maybe if it's the guy, you know, had narcolepsy and he's going to operate the forklift, okay? Well, maybe that's something where, you know, can we actually measure that they're better? Um, so be very, very careful with those. All right, substitution of paid leave, okay? They can ask or you can require that they use vacation or PTO, okay, before they go out on an unpaid leave of absence. All right, that's fine. That's under CFRA. You can do that under the FMLA as well. If it's for their own serious health condition, okay, that's the only time when you can require the use of paid sick leave, okay? There's a you know, little wrinkle there, because we now have the new California paid sick leave law that will also go into effect July 1. I, under the paid, new paid sick leave, employees can use paid sick leave to care for family members. So I suspect that the employee can also demand to use that new California paid sick leave if the leave were to take care for um, a family member with a serious health condition, okay? Generally, if the employee asks to use that leave, it's gonna be fine. Where this problem comes up is when the employer is demanding, I want to make sure you use that leave up, okay, while you're out before you take unpaid leave. If they're getting a partial wage replacement through the EDD, okay, so now I'm out on disability and I'm not making my, as much money, they go to the EDD, look for disability insurance, and they're getting that wage replacement, you can, you can offset that with whatever PTO and stuff they have in place, okay? You can't demand that they use that. You only get to demand it when they're out on an unpaid leave. As soon as they're getting money from the EDD, this is not an unpaid leave anymore, okay? It's a paid leave, it's paid through the EDD. So you wanna be careful about that, okay? Be careful when you start demanding that the employees use up uh, that time. I know it's, it's um, tempting and everybody wants to get those leave banks down. Um, all right, health benefits. Um, 
the regulations really target the fact that the leave benefits under CFRA and under FMLA are separate and apart from any other leave rights that a person might have under other laws, okay? In particular for California, under the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, okay? Um, or under the Fair Employment and Housing Act, all right? When those 12 weeks are up, okay, and the person can't come back, I still have a serious health condition, it's 12 weeks and one day, you know, zzz, here comes the fax in from my doctor saying they need another month off, okay, and the employer says, what? It's been 12 weeks in a day, that's it, we're terminating them. No, 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 okay. At that point, this is a disabled employee who's not able to perform their essential job duties and we have to go through the interactive process, that dialogue where we invite them to have a conversation with us about whether or not there might be a reasonable accommodation, okay. So don't, it, it doesn't end at 12 weeks, all right. And I will tell you from experience in litigating these things that typically if you have somebody who's already been out for 12 weeks and they ask for another four weeks or another six weeks and you think this is unreasonable, if you've survived for 12 weeks without them, it's pretty difficult to go in and argue it's an undue hardship for them to be gone another day, another week, another minute, okay? You're fighting a, a real uphill battle, all right? So don't think that it ends at 12 weeks. They, they really talk about um, in terms of, um, did I go on, did I go to the wrong slide? Oh, I moved ahead, I moved ahead one. Um, okay, I'll go back to that slide. Um, but they really talk about how, look, the, the CFRA, this is one leave right, okay? But you might also have other leave rights. When we talk about pregnancy in particular, they get up to four months before the baby is born, okay? I'm not burning any CFRA during that time. When the baby is born, I mean, I may be totally out of FMLA because FMLA covers pregnancy, so the baby's born, I have not one second of FMLA left, okay? Well, you know, whoop-de-dee, because I've got 12 weeks of CFRA, all right? And those are two separate distinct rights, all right? And so I, I took my four months of pregnancy, now I take my 12 weeks of CFRA, but I had a horrible delivery and I can't come back and I want another six weeks. On top of that, as a disability accommodation, that's probably, you know, going to be okay or pro at least is something you're gonna have to consider and you're really gonna have to show a, a, a sincere uh, or a legitimate reason why that would be an undue burden, okay, or why that accommodation wouldn't be reasonable. Um, okay, before I go back, I'm gonna go back to the health benefits. When they're out on, on CFRA, okay, we continue their health care benefits, all right? They have to pay their part of the premium and we continue it on the exact same terms and conditions as it existed when they were still here and working. Okay, generally, you know, it's pretty hard. I know most of my employers deduct that, that premium with their paycheck, okay? So it can be hard to recoup that money. You wanna set up a plan before the person actually goes out on leave, if you can, of how they're gonna pay their portion of the premium. They're gonna pay it on the first of the month, they're gonna pay it when it would have been taken out during the payroll process, however you wanna set that up. A lot of employers say, we'll cover it when you come back we're gonna recoup that money. If you don't come back, you're gonna to need to write us a check at the end. You know, it's, as a practical matter, very difficult to go after that employee, I mean, unless you wanna take them to small claims court to recoup those, so it's better to ha get the payments up front. Okay, if they're not making their share of the premium, you know, you may wanna give them a little grace period, but if they don't make it, send them the COBRA notice, sorry, you've gotta pay your share of this health coverage. All right, okay, sorry for jumping around here. Um, retaliation and interference, okay, so they give all these examples. You can't interfere with somebody's right to take CFRA. So how, how would you interfere with that? Well, you might interfere with it by denying their CFRA leave, okay. Um, you can't shuffle employees around. I can't, you know, move one office, you know, an extra 10 miles away so that now my employees are more than 75 miles apart or whatever, okay. I can't say, oh, shucks, you're at, you know, at 1,000, you know, 249 hours, so we're not gonna have you work anymore, okay? So they don't hit that hour requirement. I can't lay them off at the 11th month and then, you know, hire them back later, okay? I can't do the structure of the business so that I'm trying to avoid those CFRA rights. I also can't discourage them, you know, you, oh, you're gonna take CFRA, really, Joyce, really? You know, I don't get to uh, dissuade them or, or try to cajole them into not using those CFRA rights. Okay, and that's called, that's interference. Um, there can't be any waiver of rights. An employee can't come to you and say, I, wait, I choose to waive all of my CFRA rights. 
There's an exception, okay? If somebody's gonna file a lawsuit or they bring a claim and you have a settlement and release or you give them a severance package and they sign an actual release, they can release their right to sue you later, okay, for whatever um, rights you might have denied them based on leave of absence, okay? But they can't sign a waiver up front. You know, as part of their employment package, you just stick in a nice little CFRA waiver. That's not gonna work. Um, okay, posting and handbook requirements. So they updated the, the employment poster, okay, and it now addresses these kinds of things. Um, you probably put a new poster up at the beginning of the year because you were required to for the new paid sick leave law. Okay, so the, the poster manufacturer has come up with a brand new poster that you're now supposed to buy um, by July 1. You can use electronic posting, you know, if you can post it and make sure that, that all of your employees can access that, that, would, that will meet those requirements. It has to be, you know, translated into whatever language that 10% or more of your employee force speaks, um, and it needs to be up, you know, someplace where they can see it. Um, you also have to put the CFRA protections in your handbook if you have one. You don't have to have an employee handbook, but I certainly would advise that you do so. It can certainly protect you, although the little sort of cautionary tale there is make sure it's a good handbook, okay? Don't have a bad handbook. Better to have no handbook than a handbook that contains a bunch of policies that are not correct. Okay, that's the number one way to end up in a class action lawsuit. Um, so we want to get the new poster up, okay? And then we want to start using the new form, all right? I've got the new... Uh, personal or employees own serious health condition form, I'll get you the next form. But those are the changes to the form. All right, so this next section just goes through all of those places where I said, hey, there's a difference. This is different from the FMLA. I'm not gonna rehash all these because we hit on all of them, but you see the difference in serious health condition, inpatient care, pregnancy disability, all this kind of stuff. These are the things where when you get a question about leave and you're wondering, wait, which one do I go with? This is where your, the flags are going to come up and the little pitfalls. Okay, medical certifications, intermittent leave, substitution paid leave, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so what do you have to do? This is your take-home lesson, okay? I want you to review and update your handbook if you need to. Okay, inaccurate statements of eligibility requirements can waive um, the right to enforce those restrictions. Okay, this was a case they basically didn't have the provision in their handbook that said, you know, 50 employees within 75 miles. Okay, that wasn't in their policy. And they went back and looked and said, oh, shucks, well, you know what, this is one of the requirements to be eligible and you don't meet it, so sorry. And they said, nope, you, by not putting it in your policy, you've given up that restriction. Okay, so they were obligated to provide the leave. Another thing that I will mention, and I've had this come up for a few employers, they get online, they say, oh, somebody needs medical leave, oh, I've gotta give them this CFRA. Come back to find out later, well, shucks, we only had 30 employees. Okay, but we told them all they were gonna get this FMLA. Well, once you tell them, once you represent that they're going to get that, okay, you don't get to take it back later. So make sure that if you're gonna put those policies in your handbook that you need to, first of all, okay, or if you're gonna tell employees that they get medical leave, or if your supervisors are going to tell. Because when your supervisors tell your employees something, okay, they're speaking on behalf of the company. So they can make representations to that employee um, that you're gonna be bound by. Okay, so start using the new certification form, do the new poster, Okay, and make sure that your frontline supervisors are trained on this stuff. When the person gives some indication of a CFRA qualifying reason, their own serious health condition, the family member's serious health condition, baby bonding, when they give that in indication and ask for time off, make sure the supervisor knows that that's got to make its way back to management, back to HR. Because remember, we only have five days to get that form to them. Okay, so I want to make sure that, you know, if you don't find out about it until two weeks later, you know, I had an HR person call me a couple weeks ago, and she's like, I didn't even know that the lady was out on, you know, pregnancy leave until we saw these flowers in the office or whatever. You know, you think, okay, well, there's a serious communication problem going on in that workplace. All right, so. Are there questions? Yeah, Eric. When you say post the new poster, is there going to be like a uh, one that you can go online and print out? I think he'll... Um, you know, that question has come up twice now, and I don't know, I mean, I'm sure if you just get the information, if it's, as long as it's in large, legible print, you can stick it right next to the poster and just buy a new poster next year. The key is that the information is there and available and the employee can see it. Um, you know, I, and if you can use an electronic posting, then I would presume that you could also use a, you know, just a notice that you stick up next to that. I've not seen anything from the DFEH um, that is, here, print this in large font and stick it on the wall. 
Um, but I, I believe Cal Chamber has a new poster. So you could just cut and paste that part of the, that poster out and stick it on the wall. But I can look into that, sorry. Others? Oops, yeah. Uh, well, n there is no condensed FMLA CFRA policy. Yeah, when I, yeah, um, yeah. Well, and so if you're going through your hand, I mean, it depends on how old your handbook is in terms of no. I mean, if it's there isn't a lot that has to change in terms of the handbook policy based on the new regulations. A lot, most of the policies won't have a lot of these terms defined in there. You know, it'll it'll sort of reference those, but it might reference code sections and things like that. So you may not have to change that. Dep I mean, but it's going to depend on what your policy looks like. I can tell you that, I mean, they run anywhere from five to seven pages in most of the handbooks that I do. So it, if it, I mean, unless it's real small font, it might be four pages. But it's, a, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different sections. This is when, you know, you get it. This is when it's your family member. This is when it's baby bonding. This is when it's military. This is when re reinstatement is. This is intermittently. So you've got to march through all those different paragraphs. You know, and it's the crazy thing, you know, they do this so the employee has notice of all these rights, you know, but, you know, the more stuff you pack in there, it's like these warning labels. No one's going to read that. I mean, really? You know, you know. I only read it because I get paid to read it. I certainly wouldn't read it if I didn't have to, you know, but sorry, that's just me. Um, okay. Others? All right. You survived an hour of regulations. It's